Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. As I was introduced, my name is Grant Agajanian, and I know that it is too long and too hard to pronounce for some of you. Uh, Last visit, I introduced myself also for those who have a hard time to pronounce as Johnson. I won't mind that. I represent today a sure harvest ministry, which is one of the very few Adventist ministries that sharing the gospel with Muslims. Pastor Gerald, who has been here a couple of times, uh, he was asked by the Pacific Union on behalf of a sure harvest ministry to lead the Muslim outreach for the Union. And we started this ministry with Gerald about seven, eight years ago. Some of you probably remember we came here first time with just a little concert and devotional. That's when the ministry actually started. But by the grace of God, it has grown. Today we are producing and broadcasting television programs around the world covering 1040 windows, and uh, we have so many responses. Muslims are hungry for the gospel, and media presents them as the enemies. However, we need to keep in mind that 5% of them are radical, and that's what you see on TV and all the violence. And I agree with those whose hearts are broken that whatever they do, those 5% of radicals, it is evil. But uh, the question is, will we lift up the cross of Christ and present the gospel to this group of people, 23% of globe population, 1.6 billion Muslims, 95% of them will be influenced either by radicals or by the message of Jesus, the gospel. And I believe that God has raised Seventh-day Adventist movement It's not even a church, it is a movement to restore the gospel and to proclaim the gospel to all the nations. And until this is done, the end will not come. Because Jesus said that this gospel will be preached to all the nations and then the end will come. As we were broadcasting through CBN, we have received so many calls, number of underground churches, has been formed in most radical places, the Middle East. And stories were coming, callers telling their stories and experiences that angels appearing to them in their dreams, giving them the Bible studies. And they're asking for the Bibles. How many of you have Bibles, more than one, in their homes? Let me ask you this, how many of you read the Bible every day and study it? Praise God for those hands. Did you know that if Muslims in their countries get caught with the Bible in their hand, the hand that is carrying the Bible is cut off without even a court? I challenge you. While Muslims are willing to put their lives online to get hold of the living word of God, Let's not miss a day without opening this living word and see what blessing God has for us. Because this is the spiritual food that we need every day. Otherwise, we will be starving and without strength. We have today 300 programs sitting on the shelves, most of them, some of them on the air. And we are limited on funds. We have prepared also 28 Adventist fundamental beliefs, biblical beliefs, in a Muslim-friendly presentations. To 20 of our beliefs, Muslims are very closely relating. They are all scripted. And we are eagerly waiting for the funds to come to produce them into video programs and broadcast them around the world. And we believe that these programs will make an impact on the Muslim world like nothing before. 
And we believe that this will speed up the coming of the Lord because the gospel will be preached to all these nations. 23% of globe population have not heard the gospel. Do you know how many of them have been exposed to the angel's message? Out of 1.6 billion Muslims, less than half of 1%. We have a work to do. So we have brought ministry envelopes, and uh, if the deacons at this point can distribute those envelopes, at the end of the service, there will be a love offering. Those who would like to support this ministry, who are touched by the presentation, you are welcome to do it. It will be much appreciated. I don't know if uh, we mentioned to you a story at last visit that's still standing out and developing. A woman called us from Iran and said that she had been watching our programs and accepted Jesus as, their, as her Savior. And as a result, she said, husband, when he found out that I became a Christian, he began to beat me every day. And uh, my two sons denied me and called me a prostitute. Doctors found tumor on my liver, and uh, it is a cancer. Did I make a mistake by accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? And uh, we asked her, and she mentioned that she doesn't have a Bible. There's no Christians around, no churches. What do I do? And we led her to their book, Quran. And by the way, I'm not promoting any other book. The only book that is inspired by the living God and is to live by, it is the Bible. But what they have done, they have borrowed verses from the New Testament and placed them in Quran that says something very positive about Jesus, that Jesus is the son of Mary, he is the life giver, he is to be followed to the bay, he was raised from the dead, he is coming again. We have a list of probably 25 of those statements in the Quran. And we gave her some of the statements and asked her to read to her husband, and we will call you in a week. We forgot to call. But three months later, we got a call from the same woman who said that she has done what we asked. And uh, since that day, she said, my husband, every time he leaves home, he kneels before me and he is kissing my hands. My two sons reconciled with me and they love me. Doctors took me to the hospital. They operated me. They found no tumor on my liver. They put me back. And by the way, she said, thank you for the Bible, for sending me a Bible. We never sent a Bible to her. We still do not know how she got it. But then she said, I want to serve Jesus. I have some funds. I will go to a neighboring country of Armenia, which is a Christian country, and I will buy a land there and build a church for my people to come and worship Jesus without fear of being persecuted. So we were very skeptical, but a few months later we got a call from Armenia. Guess who was calling? The same woman. And she said to us that I am in Armenia. I have already 15 people with me. We are building the church. Please send to us all the materials that you have. And later on, we, we got an update that in that part, uh, part of Armenia, there are over 35 Iranians that were baptized into Seventh-day Adventist Church as a result of this woman's ministry. One person affected by the gospel and what an effect it brings. And we've been given the statistics by CBN and TBN that when one person responds to the show, you receive either a letter or a call that indicates that there were 1,000 viewers that were affected by the message, but they never bothered to write or call for one or the other reason. We will never know the effect of the ministry till we come to the other side of eternity, whether it is a sure harvest ministry, voice of prophecy, it is written, or your personal ministry or the ministry of this church. But for that, we need to be active. So we invite you to participate in this. And, uh, you know, one thing that fascinates me, how Apostle Paul came to Athens, he saw this altar to unknown God, and he finds a wedge to bring the gospel to these idol worshipers. And today, that country is known as a Christian country, Greece. 
God in the last days raised the Advent movement and equipped us with the fullness of the gospel. And he wants to bring this gospel to this dying world, including so-called enemies of Christians, the Muslims. Jesus said, love your enemies. It is biblical to give the gospel to them. So, at the end of the service, there will be a call. And if the Lord is touching your heart and you would like to support this ministry, it will be much appreciated. Because until we produce these programs, the, by the way, the cost of this project of producing, editing, and broadcasting for one year to 1040 window, very very low as at this point 148,000 only so it is not that much money to producing 28 programs and to broadcast them so anyway I will stop here and uh, I believe that the worship hour is to be fed by the Word of God not just telling only stories and uh, promoting some projects, but to share the Word of God. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Then I would ask you to bow your heads with me as we open the Word of God. Gracious, loving Father, once again we want to lift up our hearts to you and praise you for this beautiful Sabbath day, the day that you made available to your children to rest in you. Father, Thank you for your promised presence and thank you for your word. As we open it, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit in a special way would touch our hearts and make an impact on us that when we walk out from the church today, we will not be the same as we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, some churches tell me when to stop. Some churches don't. In this case, I've been asked by Pastor Greg that worship lasts till 12.15. And uh, I'd like to comply with that, but that would mean that I would cut out the stories. Some stories related to the message. What would you say? You agree with that? You want a story or no? Do you want a stories? Yes, just only a few. What about the rest of you? <laughs> Hmm? He, won't he won't. He will find out anyway. <laughs> I'll do my best to keep it short. I'll begin with a story. On one of the mission trips to the country of Armenia, with friend of mine, Pastor Bill, we were asked by a young man, a question, what happens to a person when he dies? And uh, at that time I was discipled by Pastor Bill and uh, trained. And he stepped in and uh, stopped me from answering. And he said to this young man, we will come tomorrow. At about this time, we will have our Bibles. You will have your Bible. And we will see what the Word of God says. As we walk out from there, my friend, Pastor Bill, told me, Grant, never share a biblical truth with anybody without first opening the Word of God because it will not be your Word that brings conviction to the heart of the person, but the Word of God. I learned my lesson. And sure enough, we came back next day. We opened our Bibles. He gathered his family around the table. And as we shared with him, through the Word of God, from the Word of God, what happens to a person when he dies? This young man was broken into tears. And he said to us, why my church never shared this truth with me? And the reason why he was in tears, it's another story. But the point of the story that the Word of God brought conviction. And I came back to U.S. and revisited 
the book Acts of the Apostles, and on page 520, I came across the statement that says, the word of God, the truth, is the channel through which God manifests his spirit and power. Wow. With that in mind, I'm asking you to open your Bibles with me today to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. This is the story of forgiveness, story of healing. This is the story of restoration. Some of you today may need forgiveness. Some of you may need healing. Some of you may need restoration. Whatever your need is, God is offering it to you today through his word. So when you hear his word, do not harden your heart. Verse 1, so he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Every time I read this passage, this particular verse, I think of a larger picture here of the ministry of Jesus. You see, Jesus not only crossed over and came to his own city, Jesus crossed over and came to his own let me explain. You see, from the very beginning, between God the Father and God the Son, there is a river of love that flows from one to another. God created a man and placed him into this river of love. Man became an object of God's love, but the enemy of God kidnapped God's children by injecting sin into human race. We became slaves to sin. Sin paralyzed us. No longer we can produce righteousness, holiness. Jesus, seeing the condition of his object of love, came to our rescue. But for that, he had to take upon himself human nature in order to be qualified to represent humanity, human race. So he laid aside his omnipotence, omnipresence, divinity, closed himself with humanity. And he did, crossed over, came to his own to restore his own because he could not live with the thought seeing human race being enslaved forever. He came to save us from sin. According to Matthew 1, 21, salvation is a deliverance from sin. Just one amen. Let me repeat this. According to Matthew 1, 21, salvation is a deliverance from sin. Have you ever thought why? The Bible speaks of salvation in three different tenses. We are saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. Did you ever question that? I did, but I found the answer in the sanctuary service. We are saved, that is a courtyard of the sanctuary. We are saved because of the cross of Jesus. We are being saved, that's the holy place. We will be saved. That's the most holy place. We are saved from the guilt and punishment of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin in our lives. And we will be saved from the very presence of sin. If you haven't studied the sanctuary message, it is so deep and profound. God had outlined the entire plan of salvation through the sanctuary message. And we as Advent movement have been given this light. I'm fascinated by the sanctuary message. Verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic son, Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Point number one. This is a big one. Please hear it. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, who is this paralytic? It is the entire human race. It is me. It is you. And in spite of our condition, Jesus calls not only his own, he calls us sons and daughters. The paralytic was brought to Jesus. And Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So these people came to Jesus by faith. And every time when people coming to Jesus by faith, something happens. And I hope you are seeing here today by faith 
You are here by faith, aren't you? Still in the same verse too. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. A big factor here, one of the big factors, was the faith of the friends that brought the paralytic into the presence of God. Do you have friends or loved ones who you wish would come to God? Maybe it is your son or daughter who is wandering from God now for many years and you think that they are hopeless because sin had paralyzed them and they're no longer able to bring themselves to God. Don't you ever give up on them, no matter what sin has done to them. Bring them on the hands of prayer, prayer of faith. Bring them to the feet of Jesus. We are never to give up, even on a hopeless one, because human impossibility, it is God's opportunity. Mark relates the same story in chapter 2. If you just skip to Mark Visit Mark chapter 2, verse 2, 3, and 4. It says, Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken through, they led the bed on which the paralytic was lying. The paralytic was brought to the house where Jesus was, and there was no room, not even near the door. Often, there are those who seek Jesus are the ones who prevent the lost to see Jesus. But praise God for the friends who have faith. The story did not end there at the foot at the at the door of the house through which they could not bring their friend into the presence of God. A true faith always finds a way. It never gives up. It will never be turned down. A true faith always seeks for the benefits of others. A true faith will always break through. And indeed, they have broken through the roof. Just use your holy imagination. Imagine that you are there in that house. Jesus is in town, people flocking around him. He came into the house, and people gathered in. There is no room, not even for the elbow. And Jesus is preaching the word to them, and you are standing there in their midst. Suddenly you begin to hear the sound on the roof. You look up, the ceiling is cracked, the pieces of clay begin to fall down. There is a hole in the ceiling. It gets larger and larger. Finally, it got so big that you could see a bed coming down through the roof. The eyes of everyone are fixed upward. What would you say about those people? Those people who broke through I would say that they are crazy. What about you? This is not even their house. You see, these people were so determined to bring their friend to the feet of Jesus that they were willing to pay the price, even to be ridiculed. Do you have that kind of friends? Are we that kind of friends? And as the bed is coming down through the roof, the paralytic does not see Jesus at first. The only thing he could see are the hands of the friends that are holding tightly to the rope that is attached to the bed, and their faces are lighted with anticipation of what is about to take place. Wow. If your hands are not strong enough to bring your loved ones to the feet of Jesus, get more hands. Where two or three gather together in my name, he said, I am in the midst of them. And whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Psalm 
So how is your faith today? Did you give up on those for whom you were praying for years that because there is no change, maybe things got worse? You gave up. Forgetting the promise that God has given us through the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, even the captive of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible will be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you and I will save your children. Looking at the paralytic, catching his pleading eyes, Jesus said to him, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Wow. Just like that. Paralytic did not have to become good before he was restored. He came to Jesus as he was, and he was restored. Same it is with us. We come to Jesus as we are, realizing our need in him, realizing our sinfulness. And you know what happens? We are justified. You know what the word justification means? I'm sure you know. You have a good pastor here. But for those who don't, justified means declared righteous. And as you continue to come to him every day of your life, realizing your wretchedness, your sinfulness, your inability to save yourself, he will make you into what he declared you to be. That's the work of sanctification, his work. So your work is as you realize your wretchedness, inability to save yourself, and coming to him every day of your life. So today Jesus is looking at each one of us. Feeling our emotional pain, our physical pain, our relational pain, and he's saying to us, Son, daughter, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. But according to Hebrew 9.22, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. By saying to the paralytic, to you and to me, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus is making a commitment to go to the cross. Where on the cross, our guilt, our sins, our shame, our judgment, even our second death was going to be put on him and it will kill him. Why? Why would Jesus have willingness to go through such an agony? Well, I found out two reasons why. Number one is because there is a sin problem. Many still playing with sin today. Let me give you a radical definition of sin. Sin is a blatant mutiny against God. And either sin or God must die in my life. If sin rules in me, the life of God in me will be killed. If God rules in me, sin in my life will be killed. The culmination of sin problem was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what was true in the history of God on earth will be true in your history and mine. That is, sin will kill the life of God in us. And the second reason is this. Jesus was willing to go through the agony of losing his existence because he loves you. Let me tell you about this love. In John 17, 23, Jesus is saying to his father, praying to his father, saying, Father, that they may know that you love them as you love me. I am bringing it home now by paraphrasing. Please hear it. God the Father loves you not less than he loves Jesus Christ. I don't know. 
It's tough to stay here. You know why? Because it is very discouraging at a statement like this to see people who are listening and not saying even amen. That tells me that you did not understand that. I will repeat it again. God the Father loves you not less than he loves Jesus Christ. Me, a wretched and sinful man, not less than he loves Jesus Christ. And then he goes in John 15, 9, he says, just as much as Father loves me, I love you that much. So we have God the Father and God the Son who loves us infinitely. And then Jesus does something so radical. He goes to the cross and on the cross, he is tempted three times. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. Jesus is the Son of God. He could do it. But could he, by coming down from the cross and saving himself, save us also at the same time? No, he had to make a choice. And the choice that Jesus made to remain on the cross, to experience the eternal death, that cup of wrath of God that we should take and to lose our existence, he just tasted death, eternal death for everyone. And as he is tempted, and he stays on the cross, you know what it says to me? Every time I look at the cross, it speaks loudly to me. I could hear the voice of God. And it should speak to you today. From now on, as you look at the cross, it should speak to you. Whoever you are, you can put your name there. It speaks to me, Grant, I love you more than I love myself. That's who God is. God who loves you more than he loves himself. Are you coming to the church to get a credit? To attend the church on the Sabbath? To bring your tie? And missing the point. Coming to worship God. The creator who loves us more than he loves himself. How is your faith today? Thank you, sister. Please keep it coming. That will keep me preaching. So, in what condition, by the way, let me ask you this. As Jesus is hanging on a cross, with your sins there on him. The father, when he cried out to him, Father, why have you forsaken me? You know what the father did? According to Isaiah chapter 59, 52, 53, father actually turned his face away from Jesus and said, let him die. Do you know why? Because on the cross there, when Jesus hanged, he became sin for us. You know what that means? He replaced me on the cross. He was not dying just for me. He was dying as me. And that means when Father looked at Jesus, he saw Grant on the cross and he said, let him die fascinates me the plan of salvation let me ask you this when adam sinned where were you give me a biblical answer where were you when adam sinned we were in adam the condemnation fell on adam it's ours also but it became a reality when we were born but we were in adam when adam sinned now, whatever Adam has done, we inherit it automatically. You agree with that? Jesus became the second Adam. He stood at the head of humanity. He lived a righteous life. And uh, the same rule applies with the second Adam. But this one 
you have a choice. You did not have choice to be born through Adam, the first Adam, but to be born through the second Adam, to be born again, you have a choice. And I believe all of you made a choice today. And as a result, whatever Jesus has done, it is yours. God had credited this to you. Whatever happened to Jesus, God considers that it happened to you. And then, God did not stop there. He took the entire human race in the body of Jesus, in the flesh of Jesus, and brought the whole human race to meet the justice of the law. The good news is, your judgment already has fallen on Jesus, and your second death is not in your future. Isn't that the good news? And so Jesus, with the heart that overflows with love for you, he is saying to you today, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Did you embrace that forgiveness? Maybe you're struggling to forgive yourself for the things that you have done in the past. You can say to me, Grant, you have no idea what I have done. You know what? I don't care what you have done. You know why? Because the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cleanse us from all sins. And if you holding on to that and cannot forgive yourself, you're basically claiming that the blood of Jesus is insufficient. Let it go. God desires you to grow free from this guilt. Let it go. All that you have done has fallen on Jesus on the cross. It killed him already. The price was paid for all your sins. That's why he had the right to say, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Maybe you cannot forgive somebody else. Maybe it is your son or daughter who wandered from God and friction is existing in the family. Maybe a family member, a church member, co-worker, neighbor, former friend, somebody had offended you. Or maybe you offended someone and the relationship is broken. I challenge you today. Before the sun goes down, make it right. This is our Christian responsibility. Because if we don't, you may say, it's not my fault. And it may be not your fault at all. Maybe it's the other party that is at fault. But you as a Christian, we are to go to that person and to restore that peace. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus expounding on the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And he explains the depths of this commandment. If someone is angry with you and says something about you, he is in danger of the hellfire. And therefore, if you do not go to reconcile with him, you are a murderer because he will be in hellfire and this is your responsibility. Here's what will happen to you. If you make that decision today to reconcile with the person that the relationship is broken, you will obtain such a peace and joy in your heart. You will gain your brother, your sister, your friend, your church member, your son, your daughter. Try this. You will live a little longer. Did you know that? I challenge you, allow the Holy Spirit to flow fully through you, through your life. And for that, you must make this step. Do not hinder the Holy Spirit in your life. And in what condition was the paralytic when he said, your sins are forgiven you? The condition of the paralytic is the condition of the every entire of the entire human race, very well described in Romans 5. While we were ungodly, helpless, sinners, enemies of God, God had reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. 
verse 3. It says, And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemies. And Mark, in verse 7, adds something else here. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? What, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew their thoughts. These facts should have convicted them. Only God can know the thoughts of man. They should have realized that the Son of Man is the Son of God. They should have realized that they are standing in the presence of their Maker. And by the way, Jesus knows our thoughts. And what is it that he says here? Calls evil. Let me bring it home. The thought that God cannot forgive your sins is evil. I hope you're hearing this. Verse 5. For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power, authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Point number two. Arise. Arise from being paralyzed by sin into a newness of life. Jesus speaks here not only to the paralytic, but to every human being who is affected by sin. That goes to each one of us. Arise from being dead in sin, paralyzed by sin into a newness of life. And the Creator, Jesus Christ, who spoke the world into existence, and by his word, the universe was created. His word still has power today to recreate and to restore. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you from the dead? Then you can believe that Jesus can give you victory over sin. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How much of our time are we supposed to spend with Him, who is the Word of God, Word that became flesh? The Word of God, the truth, is the channel through which God manifests His Spirit and power. If you want to experience that Spirit and the power of God in your life, you are to spend time with the Word of God on a daily basis, and not only reading it and studying it, but to act upon the Word of God. And the moment you act upon the Word of God, you can have an assurance that the Holy Spirit is in you, because it is He who wills and does His good pleasure in you. Let me give you a couple of powerful statements. It is the study of the scripture that ennobles, awakens, and develops the faculties of the human mind to its highest potential. Wow. There's another one from Christ's Object Lessons, page 38. This blew me away. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power. And here's what the power is. The very life of God. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of God, by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word of God is receiving the very life and the character of God. Wow. Verse 7. And he arose and departed to his house. You see, he acted upon the word of God and he was restored. It is same with us. It is by acting upon the word of God that we are restored from the damages of sin. Verse 8. Now, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to man. Point number three. God is glorified who had given such power to man. What did they see? 
They saw a restored life. Restoration happened through the Word of God. The Word of God, the truth, the channel through which God manifests His Spirit and power. In my own life, I have experienced that power. At age 20, I was drafted to serve in the Russian army from the south part of Russia. I've been taken all the way to Siberia. And believe you me, I haven't done anything to deserve this. It was mandatory. And uh, winter was eight months every year. The temperature was dropping so cold. 40 below zero by Celsius. I survived. But when I came back home, I was very seriously ill. Spent six years in hospitals. And after six years, doctors told me that you have one year to live. And I was an atheist. Imagine the thoughts of a young man, an atheist, who have no hope, just one year of misery and pain. By the grace of God. You know, I, I was crying, an atheist crying to God to help me. I cannot explain this till now. But what it means to me that God placed in the heart of every individual a void. And it was activated in my life. And as I was crying to God in my misery, God had heard me. Somebody had given me the Bible. As I was reading the Word of God, I believed that there is a God. And as I began to act upon the principles I have found in the Bible, my health began to improve. Within one year, it was restored. For 26 years now, every day I wake up, I praise God for another day of life. What about you? Are you praising God today? Or you're dragging yourself from the bed, saying, oh, another day? So what did they see? A restored life. What did they do? They glorified God who had given such power to man. Please notice that the word man here is in plural form. What does it mean? Here's what it means. God, through Jesus Christ, through the word of God that became flesh, gave power, authority to man to have victory over sin. I'm exhausted here. I don't know how and what I shall say that you could actually say amen. Not to me, not to me, but to the word of God. That will indicate that you are hearing the word of God. I'm not asking to praise me or just say amen to me how good I am. No, I am not good. Not good at all. If there's any goodness in me, it is Christ in me. But when you hear the word of God, God expects you to respond. The word of God, the truth, is the channel through which God manifests his spirit and power. Sin shall not have dominion over us. So if you let the word of God, the truth, to abide in you, you will allow, actually, the victorious life of Jesus to be exhibited in you. And maybe Revelation 3.20 will begin to sound in a new form for us. I am standing at the door and knock. Whoever will open, I will come in. Here's the good news of this verse. Jesus Christ already lived in human flesh. Divinity indwelt humanity, and he conquered sin in the flesh. And the reason why he wants to come in into your life and mine, because he wants to repeat the same experience in our lives, are we letting him to come in? And if we do, is he coming as a resident or as a visitor? That will make all the difference. So let me give you a last statement here. What happened according to Pen of Inspiration when... Jesus healed the paralytic. The healing of the body was an evidence of the power that had renewed the heart. The paralytic found in Christ healing for both the soul and the body. 
The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. What was first? Spiritual. These lessons should not be overlooked. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, your sins are forgiven you. The burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can give would impart vigor to, vigor to the mind and health to the body. Physical disease, however malignant and deep-seated, was healed by the power of Christ. But the disease of the soul took a firmer hold upon those who closed their eyes against the light. Leprosy and palsy were not so terrible as bigotry and unbelief. How is your faith today? Are you praising God today? Jesus came to his own. You are not alone in this struggle. I am with you always, even to the very end, Jesus said. Jesus came to forgive, to heal, and to restore his own. And you are his own and precious possession. Even when you were ungodly, helpless, sinners, enemies of God, God had reconciled you to himself through the death of his son. I don't know how to say this so people can hear. Shall I shout it or whisper it? I'm going to say something now. Which way would you prefer so you can actually hear it, so you can come home? Shout it. You are loved. You are loved. And it doesn't matter whether you feel it or not. It has nothing to do with our feelings. This is the fact that took place 2,000 years ago on the cross of Christ. Where God has revealed to us that he loves us more than he loves himself. Based on that, as you're hearing the word of God today, there are three points in this passage. And God is always expecting us to respond to his word. Not only to hear, the real hearing and when people acting upon his word. Point number one, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Did you embrace this forgiveness? Or are you still struggling to forgive yourself? Did you extend that forgiveness to others? Somebody that offended you, or maybe you offended somebody and you have no courage to come and to restore that relationship, to bring apology. Whatever the situation is, we are challenged at this point by the word of God. To whom is much forgiven is to forgive much. And God wants to heal us. He wants to restore that broken relationship. It may be your son or daughter who wandered away from God. And what a joy it will bring and healing to the family. I've gone through this. I know what it means. You will gain your children back. You will gain your friends, your church members, your co-worker. If only you will make a decision and allow God to work I challenge you before the sun goes down today. Pick up the phone. Write a letter. Send an email. Visit that person. Reconcile with that person. Your heart will be filled with joy. You are not even to think that they may not respond to that. This is not your business. It is his business. You do what you ought to do to glorify God. And he will take care of the rest. And here's what will happen. Scientists discover when we are harboring unforgiving spirit or anger, it creates inflammation within our cells and brings eventually cancer of one of the organs. Why would you need this? 
one of the churches, I ask how many people making a decision today to reconcile, to restore relationship. 50% of the hands went up. Did you know what it told me? The 50% of this congregation, it was in San Diego, 50% of the congregation were lacking the fullness of the Holy Spirit in them. That's another benefit you will have. If you choose to do it, you will have fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Why wait? So, the Word of God is challenging us. If there is anyone sitting here today who is convicted by the Word of God and making a decision to make it right today with the other party, whether it is your fault or not, it doesn't matter. I ask you to stand up. If you want to come forward, I want to pray for you. There is someone... Praise God. That is a brave man. Praise the Lord for these people. This is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is present here. When you hear his word, do not harden your heart. If there is someone else sitting here today, you are not to think about the person next to you. This is between you and God. If you want to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you want to live longer, to have a better health, to have healing, physical, emotional, spiritual. Don't let this moment to pass by. Praise God for these people. Anybody else who is brave enough to stand for God today and to bring that reconciliation, restoration, allow Him to do this work, you can be assured that the Holy Spirit is already working upon the hearts of those parties. Praise God for these people. Praise God. Point number two. Point number two. Arise. Arise from being paralyzed by sin into a newness of life. If there is someone sitting here today that is paralyzed by sin and hungering to have victory in his life, hungering to overcome with this besetment, this besetment of sin in your life. God is offering this to you because by His word, the universe was created and He is saying to you, Arise. Arise. His word has power to heal and to restore. It is the channel through which God manifests His spirit and power. If you are sitting here today and you are craving for that victory over certain things in your life that you know it's not right, I ask you to stand. I want to pray for you as well. Praise God. Praise God. God is present among us. Point number three. God is glorified who had given such power to men. God is glorified. If you want to be a recipient of that power of God, there's something to do for us. We are to partake of the Word of God and to act upon it. And the moment you act upon the Word of God, the healing takes place. God is glorified. Here's what happens. The moment you act upon the Word of God, there's an assurance that it's the Holy Spirit who wills and does His good pleasure in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And according to Desire of Ages, page 805, it says the impartation of the Holy Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. And here you have a Jesus in you. And the good news is Jesus is not attracted to sin. He is attracted to holiness. And the key is to act upon the Word of God and you can have an assurance that Jesus will be in you. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. God made it very simple for His children. Praise God for these people. Let us pray. For those of you, by the way, who would like to make the decision to glorify God, I guess that the entire congregation at this point should be on their feet. If you desire to glorify God in your life by acting upon the Word of God, you can stand. 
gracious, loving Father. What a privilege it is to come into your presence with a sense of awe, not the fear, Father, that you are there to get us, but you are, Father, trying to get everyone into your kingdom. And you reveal this on the cross of Jesus, how much you loved us. You and your Son love us more than you love yourself, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful picture of your character, undistorted picture. Lord, with humble heart and humility, I lift up my voice to you on behalf of this congregation, praising your holy name for the cross of your Son, that through the blood of Jesus, Father, we are reconciled to you, we are justified, we are adopted children of yours. And as your children, Father, we boldly come into your presence with our requests. We are broken, Father. We need healing. Father, we are sinners in need of Jesus. And as we realize that there is no other person to turn to but you. You created us, Father. You love us. And you are in the process of saving us. You've done everything. So, Lord, we are willing to respond to you. The precious children of yours stood up today, expressing their desires to glorify you by reconciling with those people in their lives. And Lord, what a joy in heaven will take place when this decision will be fulfilled today. Another victory on this planet will be won for you, Lord. And the enemy will be pushed back because he is the one that brings the destruction and ruins the relationship, the families, the friends. So, Lord, I pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon these individuals in a very special way. Give them grace, give them desire, Lord, and place your love within their hearts to come and to reconcile with their loved ones, with their friends, the church members, whoever is there, Lord, that the unity will be experienced, that the peace will be there, because you are God of peace. So, Lord, go also before them and begin that work upon the hearts of the other party. And bring, Father, that healing, the forgiveness, restoration to the lives of these people. And Lord, there are those who are struggling because we are still living in sinful and fragile human flesh. And Jesus had experienced everything we go through and he provided sufficient provision, Lord, to overcome. And so, Lord, we come to you Confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we claim your promise to indwell in us. Through the Holy Spirit, bring the very mind of Jesus, the desire, the feelings, the motives of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, Father, and the strength to act upon the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit will continuously to have Jesus abiding in us. And Father, these victories in the lives of these people that stood up will be won for your glory. And give them grace, do not take credit, Father, but to give glory to you, that you may continue to work in their lives and to strengthen them. And Father, for the rest of us, we are willing not only to be readers and hearers, but the doers of your word, that we may bring glory to you every day of our lives, that the world will begin to see Jesus Christ in human flesh again. Father, bless this congregation. Bless the pastor, the leaders of this church. Bless your movement around the world, Father, that we may faithfully finish the work, that Jesus may come. So, Lord, until then, as we part ways, I pray that your peace will sustain each one of us, your protection. Bless those who are weak, who are struggling in any area of life. In a special way, I lift up to you, young people, that your guidance, Father, will be upon them, that your Holy Spirit will continuously work upon their hearts and keep them on a narrow path. There are too many distractions in this life. Father, I pray also for the elderly and weak and sick in this church. They need you, Lord. Carry them through this trial of weakness. May they feel your strength within them and the joy and the peace of Jesus that you are so freely offering to them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be seated, please.
I have final announcement to make before there will be a love offering, I understand. All of you have received the ministry envelopes. How many of you did not receive? May I see hands? All of you have. Keep in mind that we are one day closer today to the coming of Jesus. This is a good news. But there's other side of this coin that we are one day closer for millions to be lost. As I mentioned that we are eagerly trying to raise these funds and we believe that they will come, whether it's from here or not, but if the Lord is touching your heart and you would like to be supportive to this ministry, to reach out to this group of people, that Jesus may come soon. You have the envelope, the name of the ministry, the ushers will be, the deacons will be collecting it with love offering. We appreciate your support. Keep us in your prayers. And one more quick thing that uh, as you exit the sanctuary today, outside there is a table. And uh, every place I go, I bring materials that bring revival to our church members. I was a Pharisee for a number of years being in the church. I was so legalistic. I knew all the doctrines and I lived up to them, but it never gave me peace and assurance and approval of God. Then I visited a seminar by the person, Pastor Bill Liversidge, called Victory in Jesus. I drove all the way from Thousand Oaks to Bakersfield Attended the whole weekend, and the light for me went on finally. God in His mercy brought me to this seminar. I began to see and understand the gospel. And when two came together, the gospel and the doctrines, and the Christ as a center, I ended up in ministry. I could not help. These materials will be available in the format of the CDs, DVDs, and the book and many other seminars by the same person. He's the one that actually trained me into ministry, and uh, we have a variety of different programs on all our networks today, and the responses are incredible for people around the world. So you have the opportunity to obtain them today, and you can take them home, sign up your name, and one thing is there's a suggested donation for them. It's a... Uh, separate ministry and uh, we our ministry owes for all this it will go to them whatever will be signed up there and uh, if you cannot afford this or you don't intend to pay please just don't bother but for those of you who are hungering for a revival you owe this to yourself to your family and friends i would say each family must have in their library one of these materials that will bring revival to your entire family. We need to give our children especially not just do's and don'ts, but Jesus, the good news, the gospel. It will be available in the lobby. Thank you again. Forgive me, I run over again. My wife was right. She was saying that I have no sense of time. <laughs> anyway, you men listen to women sometime. They may be right. <laughs> It's a hymnal now or thank you. <laughs> 